In this video, I'm going to talk about our transistor clock project. This project was conceived of as a teaching tool for my students to learn hardcore fundamental electronics. The rules of this project were that we had to do it with the technology basically available in 1960. So that means no chips, no integrated circuits, nothing that is beyond the most simple old school transistor design. And it also had to involve significant toil, lots of soldering and handwork and fiddly detail stuff. And also something with enough complexity where the idea of system design actually is relevant. One of the main challenges in designing a transistor clock is, is really reducing the complexity. So we studied long and hard to figure out how we could make the simplest clock that really delivered with the minimum number of components, specifically the minimum transistor count. When we began this project, we obviously researched all the existing transistor clock designs we could find on the internet. And we took a lot of those ideas and incorporated them into our own thinking. We also allowed ourselves to take a close look at some of these problems and to come up with our own optimal solutions based on our own design approach rather than just following along with the standard approach for a transistor clock. And I think you'll agree that we've come up with some pretty clever ideas for some of the tricky problems. Now this thing is a monster. It's physically very large. There's a lot of circuit boards and hardware inside there. So we wanted to think of a way to create a display that had enough scale and majesty that it matched the scale of the clock to produce the best aesthetic result. Let's take a deep dive into this clock and learn about how all of it works. We decided to make our LED display out of filaments from some of those decorative LED filament lamps. Step one was harvest the filaments from a bulb. Step two was investigating them electrically to see how they worked. We discovered that they were made up of 19 LED dyes connected in series on a substrate. This means it requires more than 60 volts to light them up. We also discovered they're tremendously energy efficient. Only 140 microamps lights them up well enough to make our display look beautiful. I didn't misspeak, 140 microamps. It's incredible. The next step in the process was figuring out how we we're going to drive these. Obviously this requires a high voltage power supply. Now since LEDs are current driven devices, we opted to regulate the drive current rather than trying to regulate the drive voltage and use a resistor. This results in a simpler circuit because we can have a very sketchy unregulated power supply and the current regulator will take care of making sure that the brightness of the filaments is always constant. Designing a driver for these turned out to be relatively easy. All we needed is a single high voltage transistor that could serve as both switch and current sync in one module. The output of the seven segment decoder is a signal of about two volts. This signal gives 1.4 volts across a 10K resistor, which ends up creating a current sink of about 140 microamps. In operation, the transistor adjusts its impedance dynamically to compensate for any variations in the power supply voltage or the forward drop of the LEDs. In effect, it regulates a constant current through the filament whenever the input signal is present. Constant current equals constant brightness. Once all the electrical details were figured out, it was time to figure out how to integrate these filaments into a workable display. We modeled the filaments and set about trying to design a part that would hold them all in the correct position and protect them from damage. The time set module sits in line with the one pulse per minute signal. When you press the fast advance or slow advance button, it injects pulses of different speeds in to advance the counters. That's how you set the time. 
A two transistor oscillator creates pulses of two different frequencies depending on which bias resistor is selected. A diode ORs the output pulses back into the one pulse per minute line to advance the counters. The job of the Schmidt trigger module is to take the AC signal from the power transformer and extract a crisp, clean, noise-free square wave that can be used to drive the other counter sections of the clock. The first stage is a low-pass filter which removes any high-frequency noise. The second half is the actual Schmidt trigger which uses a switching action to make crisp, clean transitions in the output waveform. The AC input signal from the transformer is filtered by the low-pass filter made out of R4 and C2. Diode D1 prevents the negative going part of the sine wave from causing reverse breakdown of Q3. The emitter of Q3 is tied to a voltage divider comprised of R1, R8, and R9. The voltage on R9 establishes a switching threshold. When the voltage on the base exceeds this threshold, it causes Q3 to conduct. Q3 conducting causes Q2 to conduct, which actually reduces the voltage on R9. This is a regenerative action which causes the circuit to quickly switch into a heavily conducting state. Since the threshold has now dropped, the input signal has to traverse much lower for it to shut off. This difference in thresholds is called hysteresis and causes it to have a snap action effect which cleans up the edges of the square wave nicely and rejects noise. A power supply is a standard linear design. AC from the power transformer is rectified, filtered by a large capacitor, and fed to a linear regulator with a voltage reference. The main output is 12 volts DC, which powers the whole clock. It also outputs a synchronization signal for timekeeping. The bridge rectifier and filter capacitor create a DC bus of around 17 volts, which is regulated by the Darlington transistor Q1. Q2 and R1 provide short circuit protection to the power supply. The output voltage is sampled by R2, R4, and R6. This is fed back to Q3, which basically compares it to the Zener diode voltage to regulate the final output. A 20 kilohertz oscillator drives a pair of switches. These switches convert the 12 volt DC input into AC. The transformer then boosts this AC voltage up to 100 volts AC. The output of the transformer feeds a rectifier bridge and a filter capacitor, which produces the final raw 100 volt unregulated output. An A-stable multivibrator operating at 20 kilohertz, made up of Q1 and Q2, produces a complementary square wave which drives the two transistors Q3 and Q4 which drive the transformer primary. The transformer which is hand wound on a pot core boosts this 20 kilohertz AC signal up to about 100 volts. A bridge rectifier and filter capacitor provides a raw 100 volt DC output. It's very poorly regulated but that's okay because we don't need it to be a very precise 100 volts. I feel compelled to stop and interrupt here and talk about a couple of things. Number one, our clock uses the AC line as a frequency standard. Number two, our clock has no seconds display. So to get our AC line frequency, which in this country is 50 hertz, to divide it down to a once per minute pulse is a divide ratio of 3000. So 3000 is actually a 12 bit number. If we went the traditional route using flip flops, that's at least two transistors per flip-flop, and that means 24 transistors. It's a lot of soldering and a lot of fiddling around. I like to torture my students, but that's just S&M. So we thought we'd think of, up a different way to achieve that, 
and we actually went analog. And I think you'll see it's kind of cool the way we accomplished this. It does the job with only 14 transistors. So how does an analog pulse divider actually work? Well, here we have four stages of a stair-step divider cascaded to do the final division. Each stage uses a current source and a switch to charge a capacitor in steps. Each step is one count. It charges up until it reaches a final threshold where it resets and discharges the capacitor starting the cycle all over again. By controlling the current and the on time of the switch, you can control the step size and therefore the dividing count. Now we found that we could do stages of about 10 before analog vagaries like leakage and thermal effects started to rear their ugly heads. So using the cascaded counter method, we're able to divide by 3,000. So the last counter in the stage only divides by three. That one is the smallest division ratio because it has the longest time period. The input to that one is a pulse every 20 seconds. So since it divides only by three, the leakage has the least effect on that counter. These counters can be just calibrated with a potentiometer to divide by a specific number. And over a fairly wide range of frequency, it works well and it's very stable. Here's the schematic for the overall pulse divider board. Let's zoom up close and have a look at one of the stages and figure out how this thing works. Each stage is comprised of four basic elements. There's a current source which charges the capacitor, the capacitor itself, an SCR that's formed by the two transistors, and a voltage divider that sets the reference voltage. When the previous stage triggers and resets, in this case that would be Q7 going into conduction, it creates a voltage drop across R2. R2 drives the current source, which is Q1, R13, and R4. That current source outputs a constant current into capacitor C3, charging it up. Now this capacitor is a very special type of capacitor. It's a metal film polyester capacitor. These capacitors are very large, expensive, and awkward, except they have fantastic properties. They have extremely low leakage, low dielectric absorption, and they withstand high voltages. They're also very stable and capacitant, so they make an ideal capacitor for this kind of precision circuit. Q5 and Q8 form an SCR as they are connected. The base of Q5 is connected to a reference voltage that's formed by the voltage divider R11, R19, and R39. The voltage on Q5's base sets the trigger threshold. As the capacitor charges to the threshold, D7 starts to conduct, which causes the two transistors to go into a latch-up mode, which causes it to discharge the capacitor through R25 until the capacitor is almost completely discharged. This process creates a pulse across R11, which is the output of the circuit, which goes to the next stage. So you can see each stage is identical and passes the pulses on in turn. The overall dividing ratio is set by the amount of current sourced by the current source. This is adjustable by a potentiometer. You could easily tune this circuit to divide by a different number just by changing the resistor values. For example, to make it work on 60 hertz, you'd need a, a different division ratio of 3,600. You could do that by making the first two stages divide by 10, and then 6, and then 6. So you have to retune the, the last two to divide by six instead of 10 and three, and then you'd have it working on 60 hertz with no wiring changes. Here's an actual oscilloscope capture from the divider board itself. This shows two adjacent channels. The top trace is dividing by 10, and the lower trace on channel two is incrementing along with each reset pulse. Notice the linear ramp on channel two as each capacitor charges. Then it basically just holds the charge until the next pulse, incrementing upward each time. Ah! 
The tens of minutes counter is the simplest counter board in the clock. It counts from zero to five in six steps. It counts directly in decimal and uses a diode matrix to map the output to the LED seven segment display. We'll go into painful detail on the next one, so don't worry, you'll get there. The minutes counter is the first stop in the counter chain. It counts directly in decimal and uses a diode matrix to map the output. This board also contains a 8 volt reference generator that's used by all the other counter boards. Let's have a look. The counter boards are by far the most difficult to fabricate. They have a lot of parts and are quite complicated. We opted to use surface mount components to make these things small and manageable. The patterns of the counters repeat very clearly, so it's actually kind of easy just to make a repeating pattern on a little circuit board and just make as many as you need. On the left side, we have the input connector that feeds in once per minute pulses. On the right side, we have the output connector that feeds out a pulse every 10 minutes. Below that, we have the display connector, which goes directly to the seven segment display unit. We have the diode matrix that maps the outputs to the display, and we also have the reference voltage generator. This generates a DC voltage around 8 volts, which is used by every counter in the entire clock. Each stage of the ring counter consists of two transistors which are connected in an SCR configuration. This means that when one starts to conduct, it forces the other one to conduct and vice versa. This causes them to latch into an on state. The only way to shut them off is to interrupt the current flow through the transistors externally. This is accomplished by Q11 every time a new pulse comes in. Q11 pulls the common rail of all the counters to ground momentarily. When Q11 shuts off, only the charge on the interstage coupling capacitor determines which one turns on next. This causes it to count in a circular fashion, transferring the charge from one capacitor to the next in a ring. The ring loops around back on itself, making it a complete counter that has no end. Let's assume that the first stage in our counter made up of Q1 and Q12 is on. This current flow causes a voltage drop across R2. This voltage drop charges C2 with a voltage that's more positive on the right hand plate of that capacitor. When the next minutes pulse comes along, Q11 effectively pulls the common rail to zero. This shuts off the current flow in all of the counter stages, effectively resetting them. When Q11 shuts off, allowing the voltage on the common rail to rise, that more positive charge on the right hand plate of C2 causes the emitter of Q2 to rise above the threshold that causes it to latch on. It then latches on and the second stage is now active. The current flow through R38 creates a voltage drop of about 2.4 volts. This goes down to the diode matrix. The diode matrix basically allows you to map which of the filaments are going to illuminate to create a digit. In this case, the digit 1 is done by illuminating two of the filaments to create the numeral 1. By using diodes to do the mapping, we prevent backflow to any segment that we do not want to light up. The hours counter module is identical to the others with the exception that it counts to 12 and has a decoder for the 1 on the 10, 11, and 12 count. This illuminates the 1 in front of the other digits. We decided to make our clock case out of laser cut acrylic. We laser cut several cardboard mock-ups so we could make all of our mistakes in cardboard and not in acrylic. It's just so much easier that way because you can fiddle around and make mistakes and it doesn't really cost much.
Once we had everything sorted out, we went ahead and cut the final parts in acrylic. The assembly process took us about an afternoon. It went really well. The final wiring also went quickly because our clock was basically a modular design. We just had to make up a bunch of cables to plug everything back in and add a fuse and a power connector for the main power transformer. Solder it here. And put the fuse in line. Put the fuse on. But in this country, I don't think people pay much attention to that. The project you just witnessed took place over about a year. It was a lot of work, but I think we all learned a lot and had a good time. I know I did. I'm going to put links down below in the description for downloading the schematics and block diagrams. So if you want to play along at home and make one of these things, you're more than welcome to. Also, if you want to see more content like this, please like and subscribe. Thank you very much.